It's been a few days since the Juan Soto news for him signing with the New York Mets shook the baseball world. What does his signing mean for the Pittsburgh Pirates and for baseball? You are Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome back, everybody, to the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Ethan Smith, your host of the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Follow me on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates for all of your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates from a lifelong fan to lifelong fans just like you. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, more like tonight's episode, is brought to you by FanDuel.com. Go bet on hockey, go bet on basketball, go bet on college football, go bet on baseball futures if you want, and of course the NFL. You bet on all of that at America's number one sportsbook, FanDuel. Today's episode is going to be kind of all over the place, okay? Because initially, as, as noticed by what I just said in the intro, We're going to be talking about Juan Soto a little bit. And a lot of you clicking on this episode or listening on your audio platforms may be thinking, Ethan, why do we need to talk about this? Well, we'll get into it in a minute. Uh, The second part of today's show will be a potential new trade partner uh, that I like for this team with some rumblings going around at winter meetings. And then we'll obviously touch on Dave Parker getting into the Hall of Fame, which happened on Sunday night. Starting with Juan Soto. So before we even get into the Pirates' perspective of this, let's just talk about it. I think it's fun to just talk about this signing for Juan Soto. Juan Soto signs for $765 million, heads to Queens, away from the Bronx, stays in New York, but goes to Queens instead of the Bronx to go to the Mets. Now, if you listened to the show yesterday, uh, me and Gary, just to give some clarity, Recorded that on Sunday. So that was before Juan Soto had signed. That was before Dave Parker got into the Hall of Fame, which I said that I never thought he'd have a chance to get in, but I guess I'm stupid. (laughs) He got in. (laughs) But you heard me on that show say that I thought he would end up with the New York Mets. And Gary's point was still very good. I think he still made a fabulous point in saying that he thought the Yankees would get the respect to have the final say in what was going to happen and have the chance to match. We've had rumors come out and things come out that said they didn't. Steve Cohen just unloaded his checkbook to go get one of, if not the best young player in baseball in Juan Soto, who, let's see, has won a World Series with the Washington Nationals, revitalized a San Diego Padres team that was looking to contend forever and was a big part of that and then did something for the Yankees that they haven't done in 15 years, which is get to the World Series. Now, they obviously didn't get the outcome that they wanted against the L.A. Dodgers, but he was a massive part of why they were there in the first place. So now Juan Soto goes to the Yankees or the Mets and there's ripple effects to this everywhere. I mean, absolutely. On the surface, one, this changes the Yankees' entire offseason. I mean, they have to go do astronomically different things now. Same thing goes for teams like the Boston Red Sox. Keep that name pin. The Toronto Blue Jays, who kind of just seem to always be the bridesmaid of these things, that don't, that they're there, but they don't really ever get it done. And the Dodgers, I think, were involved, but I don't think they were ever getting them. Juan Soto did express that he wanted to stay on the East Coast. So it has ripple effects for all these teams because now if you're the Mets and you go get Pete Alonso, which I fully expect them to do, I fully expect them to bring back the Polar Bear, that's a World Series team. That is a team that has the ingredients to win a World Series. They were just barely away from it this year on kind of an Arizona Diamondbacks-esque run. So yeah. Absolutely, the Mets should be World Series contenders against the L.A. Dodgers, the Philadelphia Phillies, the Atlanta Braves, etc. It then obviously has ripple effects with the teams I mentioned because they now have to ch- they have to change their stance now. 
They have to change how they're thinking about the offseason. They have to go find outfield help elsewhere that they were looking for. Then we take it back and we step behind the curtain to what everybody might be thinking. Really? Really? You're probably wondering, Ethan, why are you saying it like that? Why are, why are you expressing it in a way that kind of seems like you're ticked off? Well, because I am. Because of this right here. The, the, this symbol right here. That symbol right there. The flag that I have in my room right there. All the pirates, memorabilia, the t and all that right there. The Paul Skeens jersey that I have in my drawer. The Key Brian Hayes jersey that I have in my drawer. Oh, wait. Pirates hat number one. Yeah. Pirates hat number two. Yeah. That's why I'm ticked off. Because... The past two off seasons, and you see it every off season, but I think there's been more of an emphasis on it now, with the Shohei Otani contract and now the Juan Soto deal. Baseball is named Major League Baseball, but in reality, the league is split more than it ever has been financially. Now, the game itself is still beautiful. The game itself is still anybody can win on any given day against any given team. Any pitcher can throw a no-hitter. Any hitter can hit for the cycle. You could see seven home runs in one game. You could see a one nothing game. Baseball in itself is a beautiful sport. But once you start focusing on the finances, of the highest level of the sport, which is Major League Baseball, there is a massive divide with the teams that can actually spend this kind of money and the teams that can't. The New York Mets, the LA Dodgers, the Boston Red Sox to a degree, the New York Yankees, they live in a different world. They live in a completely different stratosphere of baseball for what we know. Because as Pirates fans in particular, the idea of even spending that much money on your team in a season, in an offseason, based off of his yearly contract, is an albatross to us. If we were even to match his yearly money in this offseason to add to the payroll, people would be jumping in jubilation for this team. And that's not, and that's just for one player. Juan Soto, folks, to put all of this kind of into formalities and put this all in, into really making sense of what I'm trying to say here. The National Football League and the NBA, to me, right now, I love baseball, will always love baseball. It's always going to be my first love. But to me, those two leagues are more popular than baseball. They are the two most popular leagues in America, as far as professional sports are concerned. Patrick Mahomes and Jason Tatum are the two highest paid players in those sports, respectively. Juan Soto, and it, it's just, it's laughable to even say it, is making more money than Patrick Mahomes and Jason Tatum combined. And his contract, folks, is fully guaranteed. This isn't like the NFL or the NBA where it's not all fully guaranteed money. The, especially in the NFL. That contract for Mahomes says $450 million, but in reality, it's not. But it's a number. And then you throw in the NHL. Shout out to Locked On NHL. Love you, Sean. Love you, Sean Woodley. But even throwing Leon Dreisaitl's contract in the mix, Juan Soto 
including that, almost still surpasses all three of them combined. It is insane to me that we can sit here as baseball fans from a wide collective. If you were just to get one fan who has watched their team profusely and get them all in a room, 30 people, and ask them how they feel about the financials of baseball right now, folks, I'm going to be honest with you. There's going to be at least 8 to 10 that are going to be like, it's kind of getting ridiculous. And there's a beauty in thinking about that number because at the end of the day, owners like the St. Louis Cardinals, the Atlanta Braves, we're talking about teams that contend, folks. The Houston Astros, those fans are going to probably say they're kind of fed up with it because even the Braves and the Cardinals and the Astros who are there, and the, to a degree, Chicago, the Cubs, can't spend that kind of money. And if they did, it would be dehabilitating to the rest of the roster. So what does this mean for baseball? Well, it means that you're playing on two different fields of play here. You're on two different planes of existence. And it's going to feel like it. It's going to look like it. It already does. And as Pirates fans, and to every other small market team, Reds, Royals, none of us can do this. We just can't. It's really them being the Dodgers, the Yankees, and the Mets, and again, the Red Sox to a degree, and everybody else. And I mean everybody else. The Cardinals were never going to sign Juan Soto. The Astros were never going to sign Juan Soto. The Braves would have never signed Juan Soto to that $765 million. Because they can't. Not because they won't, it's because they quite literally cannot do it. But, but, at the end of the day, congratulations to Juan Soto. He deserves it. He is a phenomenal player. Already has a case for the Hall of Fame at the young age of 25, maybe 26. I don't remember how old he is. He already has that. He deserves this money. He absolutely does. And you know why he got it? Because there's no set rules in place on how teams can spend their money. None. It is the only sport in America that does not have a salary cap, which for everybody that keeps saying, well, a salary floor would be more important. They go hand in hand. When you get a salary cap, you get a salary floor. When you get a salary floor, you get a salary cap. That's just how it works. And folks, you look at all of this and just how it affects players and fans alike. You can, it, it, you you find it hard not to feel great for a guy like Juan Soto, but at the same time, you kind of take a step back, like I have as a Pirates fan, and say. How can I get on here and confidently tell you folks that this team can contend for anything when the Mets can just spend $765 million on Juan Soto? The Dodgers, who just won the World Series, can spend all this money on Blake Snell and re signing Tommy Edmond and all this other stuff to the point where Walker Bueller, get out of here. Bye. And this first segment's went really long, but these are things that I want everybody to start thinking about, especially, especially the owners of baseball. It takes eight of you, eight, to make a real change to this sport that would make it a better sport. 2026 going into 2027 is your time to do that. Do it. But at the end of the day, again, 
congratulations to Juan Soto. Congratulations to the New York Mets. Hope it pays off for you. But for the Pittsburgh Pirates, more so, there's a new trade partner that I've kind of fancied myself with, and I think the Pirates should fancy themselves with. We'll discuss that next on Locked on Pirates. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make sure you go to FanDuel.com right now because you can get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can get uh, $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL, college football, the NHL, the NBA, MLB futures, all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL and an official sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. Don't mind me after uh, that crazy first segment of Locked On Pirates tonight. I'm just going to take a sip of my uh, drink here. Um, Yeah, I have feelings about baseball. Uh, with that Juan Soto deal, and I knew it was coming. I already kind of expected it to happen, and I'm still kind of furious about it. But we'll live, and we live in a different world than New York Mets in the same sport. Uh, So, yeah, that's my final thoughts on that. But as far as the Pirates finding a new trade partner, trades, I think, are going to be the way to go here. The free agent market seems like it's going to be kind of lucrative, As far as money goes, now I'm not saying the Pirates aren't going to make any moves in free agency. I just don't know if you're going to get what you guys, Yins, want and what I want. I mean, I would love an Anthony Santander. I would love a Christian Walker. I would love a Jerickson Profar. These are things I would love. Are the Pirates going to be able to outbid anybody? Probably not. But we're a place that don't really have to outbid anyone. You kind of have to, but not to the same degree, is the trade market. And I've already kind of discussed Cody Bellinger, Devin Williams. But let's go to where our GM was before this. We've seen him in Toronto, but most of his success was with a team I already mentioned on this show, the Boston Red Sox. Now, if... A lot of you have been following along with winter meetings like I have. You're probably starting to see some seeds be planted with this Red Sox team where they're potentially in the market for a guy like Nolan Arenado. They could be in the market for a guy like Alex Bregman. What's that start to tell you? Hmm. Well, over the last couple of years and, well, ever excuse me, ever since he's really been there, Rafael Devers has been the third baseman of the Boston Red Sox. But if you're looking at an Alex Bregman or a Nolan Arenado, that implies something to me. And that implication is that the Red Sox want to move Rafael Devers to first base. Now, um, never really said this, but Rafael Devers is one of my more favorite players in the league. and. Yeah, you move him to first base, that creates some interesting things here for this Pittsburgh Pirates team because you're also looking at a Red Sox team that needs pitching. What do the Pirates have in abundance? Oh, yeah, they have pitching. So when you're looking at a team like the Boston Red Sox and you say, okay, well, they're trying to get a third baseman to move Devers to first. What does that start to open up? Hmm. It opens up two potential cogs that I like. Two potential players that I like. The one that I'm implying for here is first baseman Tristan Casas. Now, Tristan Casas is a player that, on the surface, people are just not 
going to really like. He's very loose. He's a player that is very kind of quirky in a way. And it's just due to his young nature. He's a very young kid. 24 years of age, was born on January 15, 2000. Happy early birthday to you, bud. He's a first baseman, power hitting first baseman at that. 2024, 241 average, 13 homers, 32 RBIs, 51 hits. 799 OPS. You're looking at a guy over his course of his career, 250 average with an 830 OPS and 109 RBIs and 42 homers. Has dealt with injuries, of course. But man, does his swing profile well in PNC Park. Very nice, smooth, left-handed swing. You're looking at a guy that's also built like a first baseman. The defense is there. The power is going to come along. And when you look at this guy and what he offers for you, very controllable, for one. He doesn't hit ARB1 until 2026. You're obviously going to give him some money there. So then, yeah, maybe you got to think about extending him, but you also have your first baseman of the future at that point. And if you want to put Brian Reynolds at first base, like we've kind of seen talked about all off season, wouldn't it be nice to kind of have somebody there that you could eventually hand the keys to? And if you want it to be Brian Reynolds, sure, but I don't think I'm going to be all that mad at Tristan Casas as the DH. And especially with that swing. So, could the Red Sox be a new trade partner with the Pittsburgh Pirates here? If they go get that third baseman and move Devers to first, I don't really see a world where you're keeping Casas. I don't really see a world where you do that. Because then you have Devers at first. What do you need them for? They're very similar. <laughs> Both power hitting lefties. What do you need them for? And the Pirates desperately need players that are going to hit right-handed pitching, which keeps me with Boston. And we'll probably talk about this a little bit more in depth on another show. But Willier Abreu is another player that I think I really, really enjoy here. He's a left-handed outfielder, 253 average with 15 homers and 58 RBIs on the year last year. Like Casas, young, 25 years of age. Career 794 OPS hitter so far and 475 at-bats, so he checks the sample size box. Why not talk to them about him, too? And maybe it does cost you, oh, uh, I don't know, a Luis Ortiz. Maybe it does cost you a Thomas Harrington or a Xander Muth. Maybe it does. But what we've been saying already all off season since the season ended you guys more than i have they need bats tristan costas and willie abreu folks are bats and they are bats that you can have for a while and they are not only just bats they are good bats like these are players that i think people would love to have here costas again his demeanor is really the only turnoff but Monitor how it goes. Maybe, you know, Ben Charrington, I don't know if he still has some friends over there or not. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But there's a track record. When he has players from Boston, he does well. He won a freaking World Series off of it. <laughs> and when I mean that, I don't mean physically from Boston, Massachusetts. I just mean on the Red Sox, implying that he won a World Series with them. But will you abray you? Christian Casas, sign me up for either one of them. It don't have to be both. I would love it to be both, but it doesn't have to be both. But if they do seriously go get an Alex Bregman or a Nolan Arenado or somebody to figure out that third base position for them that isn't Rafael Devers, I think you get on the phone, Ben Charrington, and try to figure out what you can do here as far as this is concerned with improving your offensive roster. Why not? Well, to end today's show, folks, we're going to discuss Dave Parker. The Cobra is in the Hall of Fame. We're going to touch on that lightly next on Locked on Pirates. And welcome to the final part of today's episode or tonight's episode of Locked on Pirates. Everybody here on the Locked on Podcast Network. We've talked about Juan Soto. We've talked about the Boston Red Sox potentially being a 
great candidate team for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Who knows? Maybe you'll we'll, we'll go talk to the Locked On Red Sox people. Maybe let's go talk to them and see what they think. But big news out of the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, came on Sunday when, of course, Dave Parker was elected into the Hall of Fame. Will be headed to Cooperstown, so the boys will be bopping in Cooperstown in the Hall of Fame. Elected in by the Eras Committee, which many of you probably know as the Veterans Committee. So basically their job is to say, okay, we think this guy should have been in the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame voters didn't think he should have been, but we do, so he's getting in the Hall of Fame. And that's what happened here. So Dick Allen gets in alongside him. Dick Allen, a Pennsylvania native, I think more Eastern PA. But Dave Parker gets in, played his first 11 seasons in Pittsburgh, One of the best to ever do it in a Pirates uniform. At this point, maybe you retire the number 39 for Dave Parker. Um, Was a massive, massive component, if not the biggest component, to the 1979 We Are Family team. Now, again, I'm a younger guy, so don't really know too much about Dave Parker as far as actual, like, physically putting eyes on him because I, well, couldn't. Um, What I do know and what I've seen in the videos that I've watched and the games that I've watched, he looked phenomenal. And you're looking at a guy that had top five finishes and MVP uh, balloting in 85 and 86, would obviously go on to play for other teams as well, but known very much so as a Pittsburgh Pirate, was also a Cincinnati Red, battled a cocaine addiction throughout his career that he eventually figured out along through his time. And it's just awesome to see this happen. Now, a couple of you did share your thoughts on it the other day. I was going to do a small feature on it, but I decided to postpone it to this. Um, We had one, of course, from Dan Goodpaster. Uh, He said, Dave Parker was a big, imposing man, cool with the earring, throwing a little ball, swinging a heavy bat. He made baseball fun, made me a fan. Letting drugs take him down and out of Pittsburgh was sad. He eventually recovered and finished a great career. Wish he was always a pirate. That is a sentiment that I have heard before that a lot of people kind of wish that he would have just stayed in Pittsburgh his whole career. But again, you go through a lengthy list of things that happened and stuff that just kind of pushed him out. And then Pirates Queen Manchi, shout out to you. Uh, she said, you've probably already recorded by now. Well, I have technically, but we're reading it now. Uh, while I didn't have the honor of seeing him play, the power of his swing and the magnitude of his contribution was emblematic in his presence on the field during the Pirates Hall of Fame ceremony, which that's the moment that I really knew I wanted him to get in, is I want Dave Parker to be able to enjoy getting into the Hall of Fame, be able to remember getting in the Hall of Fame, because this is a guy that we're talking about here that is now 73 years old, has had and battled health issues throughout his entire life. You want him to be able to enjoy it. And I think that this is the perfect time to do it. It's going to be awesome to see him get in next year. We've seen, obviously, some Pirates get in recently quite a bit. So he'll add to the long list of Pirates that are already in Cooperstown. He'll be a phenomenal addition. And again, maybe the Pirates do actually flirt with having um, number 39 retired. I think it would be awesome to do. And, hey, why not? Let's do it. He's a Hall of Famer. Nobody should wear that number again, right? Sorry, Nick Gonzalez. Um, Yeah, Nicky G does kind of look good in that number. But it'll always be Dave Parker's number. When you see the number 39 in Pittsburgh, that will be, of course, the number that everybody will remember uh, as Dave Parker for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Shout out to you, Dave. Congratulations on getting in the Hall of Fame. Folks, congratulations to you. For sticking with me through a whole nother episode of Locked On Pirates. Make sure you find the show on all of your audio platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, and favorite this show on YouTube. Turn on the notification bell so you're always notified when Locked On Pirates is on your feeds. My name is Ethan Smith. Follow me on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates. Who knows what I'm going to be talking about anymore on those platforms. Keep watching for winter meetings. By the time you guys listen to this, we probably know where the Pirates are selecting in the draft, but we'll be talking about that tomorrow with a way too early look at the 2025 MLB draft. But until then, folks, we'll see you on the flip side.